thank you. I'm Tom Hudspeth, and I um, haven't been a regular at these teas for, for a long time. Uh, not, not from lack of interest, but from another commitment on Friday, Friday News. Um, when Val Esposito was one of my doctoral students together with Royal Bowman's, I, and she was kind of one of, on the organizing committee, I did make a few back then, but since then I haven't come out of it. So John Erickson suggested that I give a little bit of background uh, before I start into the actual discussion. Um, I, I did my doctoral work at the University of Michigan in the School of Natural Resources and Environment, and there I took a course in macro and microeconomics and another course in natural resource economics with a recycled World Bank economist named Bob Gregory. He would say things like, assume that human wants are insatiable. And I said, well, wait, 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 <laughs> can we assume? And he just said, well, that's, that's just the way, you know. And, and so, so I'm really glad to see ecological economics emerge uh, that through finding out about it through conferences, through reading, uh, and then, of course, when the, when the gun came here and John Erickson came here. So, um, so that's been exciting for me to see a, somebody who does question some of those assumptions and the whole paradigm. Uh, just quickly, I, was on, I chaired the search committee uh, that ultimately uh, brought John Erickson here uh, in 2002 and learned a lot about ecological economics um, as, as part of that, and especially from Austin. Austin Troy was on it, and uh, it was great to have him because he gave me some good readings and uh, his own insights, uh, and other members of the search committee as well. Uh, in 2003, when John uh, chaired the uh, United States Society for Ecological Economics Conference in Saratoga Springs, then a whole van load of us went down, and I presented and um, and participated in that conference, and I felt very comfortable. I wasn't sure, you know, is this is this really appropriate? But my talk was well received, and I felt very very at ease. It was not that different from environmental studies gatherings that I'd been to. What was your um, presentation? Because I went. It was on ecotourism um, and questioning: Is ecotourism a, a viable way of working towards sustainability in different countries where I've been leading travel study courses and have since led others? Uh, so that's what it's what it was about. Um, in 2004, I participated in an atelier in Palawan in the Philippines with uh, Josh Farley and Ro Bowmans, and that was exciting. The focus was on um, was on uh, intact mangrove swamps versus um, ones that have been converted to shrimp and fish aquaculture. Um, Red lobster, all you can eat for $9.99. That's where a lot of that's coming from. Other, other islands, Palawan luckily has not been hammered. M many of the islands in the Philippines, have the mangroves have been totally right there. But just uh, looking at valuing ecosystem services of, those, of the intact versus the um, manipulated uh, systems. And I, and I was very, I, I like that approach very much, and it's not that different. I, I, and I was kind of representing environmental education, environmental interpretation, ecotourism. Uh, as part of this team, this transdisciplinary team. I was very comfortable with that approach. It's not that different than ones that I had used in my own research slash um, trainings that I had done in India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Japan, Lithuania, Latvia, and so forth uh, over the years where putting together teams. I, it was different to be part of a team with ecological economists and modelers because uh, a lot of the teams that I've put together when I've done those other projects uh, have dealt with uh, conservation biologists and uh, landscape architects, graphic designers, and so forth. Uh, it's also not that different when I led 18 travel study courses for UVM to Latin America, Ecuador, Brazil, Costa Rica, uh, Belize, and Honduras. And, as part, and almost all of those are service learning courses where the students uh, partner with using an NGO in country and a lot of times short term, because some of these are over spring break, some are over January break, some are in the summertime. Uh, but nonetheless, the whole f approach that I try to use there is try to make them as much as possible, you know, problem solving teams working with members from the, N from the NGO as part of this skill share, this atelier model. So don't use the term atelier, but very, again, feel very comfortable with it. I was a participant in the Honors College faculty seminar in 2005 that Bob 
uh, Bob Costanza led that dealt with quality of life and how to measure it and so forth. And, and that was exciting just with the other faculty colleagues and Bob and resulted in some joint publications that we did in a couple of journals. One of the exciting things of teaching at a university, of course, is you're learning from your students. And you're constantly learning, whether undergraduate or graduate students, especially graduate students. And uh, so, again, Vallis Pizzito, who was one of my doctoral students. Uh, Carrie Davis uh, was on her committee as well, who did her master's work here in the gun. And, and Luce Martinez uh, took my interpretation course and uh, worked closely with her in terms of, she designed a uh, interpretive panel on this furniture, the furniture in the gun, and t telling its whole origin and all the things involved with it, and it's first rate, and I hope we can track it down. I don't know when Bob left, if it's still up in his office, or if he took it with him to Portland or whatever, but it should be on the wall, it should be on the bulletin board out here. Luce did a tremendous job, so that's been exciting. And I did participate in the Solutions uh, Seminar Series in 2010, and I'm on the listserv, which I, I'm more a lurker. I haven't, I, I sometimes will put notices about that, especially with what's going on in Japan right now and with a, uh, a brother-in-law who's a, a chemical engineer with Bechtel and uh, uh, sent forwarding some of those to him and then having him uh, get back and often, often refute what some of you folks uh, have to say, which shouldn't surprise me too much. I taught a course last year in sustainability education and as part of that had a module on ecological economics. Uh, presented a PowerPoint that Bob gave me uh, as a background, uh, had them read uh, the special issue of solutions that dealt with getting to 350 um, and so forth. And at the conclusion of that, and looking at similarities and differences between ecological economics approaches and sustainability education approaches, and lots of similarities. Um, but at the end, end of that, one of the students was, uh, you know, was packing up at the end, and the student said, oh, so you're another one of those ecological economists, are you? And I didn't know, am I? I thought, that's up to you folks. It's up to this committee that Gary's on, is if, if the answer to that question. But we'll see. Uh, I, I feel very comfortable with a lot of what's going on with ecological economics. One of the reasons that it's been exciting to me is I've been dealing with sustainability a lot for, for two decades now on this campus. And it's been very lonely. until It was very lonely until the gun arrived and John arrived. John, for those of you, the Gun Institute was relocated from Maryland, and that very next year, John came uh, from RPI to, to John Erickson came here. So um, some people, I think, some people just assume that John was with the original Gun folks, but he wasn't. But he, but so a lot of the focus on sustainability, and then again, but just they created the, a position in ecological economics at, at natural resource at the same time. That's right. That's right. And so just the approach, too, this transdisciplinary approach, which, again, I came here in 1972 to help start the Environmental Studies Program, which is, was at the time, a, the first university-wide interdisciplinary uh, Environmental Studies Program in the country at a university level. And so we were in multiple units. So, um, so uh, that, was, that was really comfortable. And, and again, things have changed since then, now that we have a Sustainability Faculty Fellows Program, that Stephanie Kaza and Walter Pullman and Wendy Berry Baranback and so forth have, have started on this campus. And of course, the leading by design effort that was, had a lot of the folks from Gun associated with it and so forth. But again, that's a lot of my interest in, because of my sustainability interest. So talking about that for just a minute. Um, I, was, I was on sabbatical in, based in uh, East Anglia in, in England in, in, in 1992 in, in 1992 and 93. And the, the, our common future, the report of the Bruntland Commission, the World Commission on Environment and Development, had come out in 1987. And it was widely embraced, this whole notion of having in, environment and development as part of the same breath rather than as opposing forces. Um, and this balancing the, the three E's or the four E's of environment, you know, e ecological integrity, and economic viability, and equity or social justice, and education. That was widely embraced on the continent and in England. Um, and while I was there, I spent some time at this amazing place in Mahantlith, Wales, called the Center for Alternative Technology. Uh, if you get over there, be sure to check it out, or, or Google it. Uh, but what they've done, a bunch of 
people about my age mostly uh, from England uh, bought this old abandoned slate quarry in Mahuntla and made it kind of a sustainability showcase, making sustainability come alive. So they were off the main, as they call it, off the grid. Uh, they had wind and solar and and um, micro hydro and, and biomass. Uh, at that time, it was a defiant stove from Vermont. It was there, was part of that. Uh, they also had a lot of the kind of things that go on in in Vail Center in terms of organic agriculture and composting and so forth. And they 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 had um, it was it was like a theme park, and they charged a lot of money. Not as much as Disneyland, but almost as much. So I can't think at the time it was twelve pounds or something. It's just, uh, it was a lot of money, and people came from all over the world to check this out. And they even had a residential dorm where people come students to come to take classes and so forth. And I was thinking, wow, this is amazing in this one space. But in many cases, we have a lot of those same kind of things in Burlington, but not just in one theme park, in one site, but dispersed in different sectors. Higher education, K through 12 education, NGOs, for-profit businesses, and so forth. And so that got me thinking about that. Um, I came back, and uh, this was when Clinton and Gore, Clinton had been elected president. He, he set up a President's Council on Sustainable Development. Uh, one of the co-chairs was Jonathan Lash, who at that time was head of, still is, head of World Resources Institute, had been a former secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources for Madeline Cunin here in Vermont. And so I was put on a task force uh, for the President's Council dealing with education and communication. And I was kind of underwhelmed, quite frankly. Uh, it was heavily dominated by, by industry, by for-profit businesses. And again, those of you, you younger folks, the, the economy was booming then in the 90s. And so there was not, you know, so it was, it was kind of sustainability light. And this was quite different than what I'd experienced for that year over in, in you know, at, at University of East Anglia and Cambridge and University of London and and Oxford and so forth, and then on the continent as well in, in Germany and, and other countries on the continent. Um, I got involved with a lot of sustainability initiatives in this community through Shelburne Farms and their Sustainable Schools Project, working with public schools in Vermont, particularly in Burlington, Champlain School and now uh, Barnes School, or some called the Sustainability Academy at Barnes, worked with uh, Orchard Elementary School in South Burlington and so forth. Work, uh, Peter Singe from MIT, uh, you know, author of The Fifth Discipline and many other books, uh, started a group called the Society of Organizational Learning Education Group. And the, a subgroup of that was Schools and Communities Learn for a Sustainable Future. So Burlington Shelburne, Burlington and Shelburne Farms area, was one of these for this kind of virtual network of schools, of school community. The whole notion is if you really want to have sustainability, in schools, it can't just be in the schools. In fact, you've got to have support from all the sectors, from businesses, from government, from higher education, and so forth. And so we were pleased to be selected and still are part of that, that group and has uh, gatherings every summer. And then in the meantime, keep in touch with each other through with serves and blogs and so forth. Uh, but it was a little bit lonely on campus. And two quick examples. Uh, I don't know where this video is going to be shown, but uh, I had. Uh, chaired a graduate program in Rubenstein in the 80s, and we at that time we had these separate graduate programs. And yet we had when Rubenstein School was noted for its um, for its core curriculum in undergraduate education, so you know commonality. We had a single doctoral program in natural resources, and yet we still had these separate programs in master's level. So they did away with those and said a single MS in, in natural resources. And yet they then started concentrations and we're talking about these were more from faculty affiliation more than anything else. And so we're brainstorming what should some of these be and I suggested sustainability would be a, a, a very good one, overarching one that would tie together. And I still remember colleagues said one of them say, you know, you know, sustainability means all things to all people and they're Therefore, nothing to anybody. Uh, it's it's just the concept du jour. You know, it this too will pass. Uh, it's just a fad. It's just a buzzword. Uh, you got to be kidding. Yeah. And then one colleague you know, again said, "Well, it's almost as whiffy as environmental study. We don't really want to be. You know, we're we're we're, we're hard nosed science types here. You know, we don't want to be you know associated with such things." Um, I, again, trans more recently, the transdisciplinary research initiative. You know, they had those ten working groups, and one of them was environment. And I went and presented 
um, to that working group and talked about sustainability as, as you know, to me, an environment, the biogeophysical environment is important, but that's only a subset of something larger, and there, we already have a lot of, of expertise on this campus in uh, sustainability as part of that, and again, they totally, and some other faculty did as well, including some from the, from the gun, and yet, I, as you know, that kind of ill-conceived report that they did, uh, no offense, Bill, and, and uh, and Celine, who, were on, who represented us, but it was dominated by some folks from other, elsewhere on campus who it was very narrow. In fact, instead of broad building bridges and all, it was a very narrow subset of environment. Um, but here we have the gun and the effort that they did with the leading by design and so forth. And so that's then my main interest in here. So talk about story for just a second. Like, you know, we said, what, what does story have to do? Part of the reason, again, I think gun and ecological economics is important is because it's t helping to tell a, a new story, a different story. And um, say, well, you know, we have you know, climate change, we have all the stuff that's going on in the world with you know, loss of biodiversity and deforestation and desertification of sub-Saharan Africa and people you know, dying of, of uh, starvation uh, every four seconds another person dies, you know, all these kind of things. Why, what, you're talking about stories? You gotta be kidding. Well, stop, let's, let's listen. So, again, we know about, if, you, if you're familiar with David Corton, with Joanna Macy, others, you, whether, whatever term you use, whether it's great turning or whatever, the ne necessity for a paradigm shift, for telling a new story or a myth. A lot of times you think, well, yeah, stories are important for Native Americans, and they're important for for the Maoris in New Zealand or for, for the Aborigines in, in Australia. Well, they're important for us, too. They, they're ways of, of any society, any culture, understanding who they are a little bit better. So one of the problems that we know, we know all too well that the model that we have right now, the story that we're telling right now, is not working. Um, so as, as it says there, a culture is going through a crisis because the story is no longer adequate to explain. All the trends about environmental degradation and social instability are a result of this failing cultural story. And we know all too well, just with, um, with, with a lot of the work of the gun, in terms of this, this story that we're telling is, you know, growth, growth at all costs. The, the economy is, um, it can grow infinitely, you don't have to worry about limits and so forth. That story doesn't work, you know. You are what you own, you are what you wear, you are how much money you make, you know. All that's part of our story. Our story to a large degree is told by, by for-profit businesses and advertisers who are the kind of the handmaidens of for-profit businesses. And so many times we don't take control of our own story. So, he says, treats economy and ecology as opposites rather than two sides of the same equation. Again, it's from this mechanistic approach. It does not, it doesn't, this story doesn't understand systems and doesn't address systems. So, so, we need to reconstruct this model, revise the myth, tell a new story that better describes what's going on. Hence, the importance of sustainability stories. So we don't need to go, you, you know uh, definitions of sustainability, you know, in fact, we all acknowledge it is tantalizingly elusive. It's fundamentally and inevitably a vague concept because one of the things that's part of the visioning part of it, it's asking people to think into the future. What type of society do we want? How do we want to live together? How do we want to relate in terms of eating our buildings, building our buildings, you know, relate to each other, getting our food and so forth. Uh, so, again, a lot of people dismiss it as rhetoric or buzzword. I don't. And personally, it's, it's very, you know, just because I had background, I had training at, as in, in ecology and ecology, animal behavior. Uh, before, I focused more in the social sciences at the doctoral level, dealing with behavioral kind of things, you know, in terms of how to, looking at lifestyle change. How can we work with people to change their lifestyles, to live more sustainably? Uh, so, you know, I, I had felt kind of split, kind of my interest as an amateur herpetologist and naturalist and in the background in ecology and all, and then over here I was also interested, just went, went to college in the 60s and it's the Vietnam War, civil rights, all the kind of things going on there, and just the equity, social justice type of thing, it was kind of like, that was a different part, but to me, all those came together. My, my doctoral dissertation dealt with citizen participation, public involvement, stakeholder involvement. Uh, so st sustainability, again, 
draw all these kind of things together for me, so maybe that's the reason I'm a lot less reluctant to dismiss it as rhetoric or buzzword. So one of the things I've been trying to do in my scholarship and through my classes, operationalizing it, making it more concrete, putting a face on it, you know, making it come alive. How? Again, not that different than a lot of other things. If you, if you take any abstract kind of thing, um, use actual projects, working models, innovative approaches, positive role models, success stories. A lot of times in the literature now they're calling them promising stories rather than success stories because we all know we sometimes learn as much or more from our mistakes than our successes, but, but they still can be promising. Um, concrete examples, um, case studies that can inspire and empower others. One of the things, that, again, I teach a course in interpretation. I have taught a course for, for several decades on interpretation. Uh, to think uh, communicating to people about natural history, about cultural heritage, when you go to a national park or a state park or a nature center or a zoo, botanical gardens, arboretum, and so forth. And that, there you're dealing with abstractions all the time. I mean, some of you have probably been to Independence National Historical Park in, in Philadelphia. You know, and, you know, the Liberty Bell is a concrete object, but, but you're interpreting things like governance and freedom and you know democratic principles and so forth. So so abstractions. So we do it all the time. Or if you've been to you know George Washington Carver Homestead, or some of these other types of things. Again, you're often dealing with abstractions, but trying to concretize them, trying to make them come alive. So in a class that I so after 1992, I came back from Spad I taught. Uh, I was teaching a senior seminar in environmental studies for all the environmental studies majors and minors. And it's a, it's a topical seminar, and I made the topic creating environmentally sustainable communities. I said, wait a minute, what's environmentally sustainable? Isn't that, why that? Well, my hope was that there would also be a creating eco economically sustainable communities that would be offered through economics or CDAE, and there would also be on dealing with equity that would be offered through sociology or somewhere. Those never quite happened. So I should just erase that environment and just say creating sustainable communities. The students learn about sustainability by extensive field trips. We had tremendous things right in this community, as you know, in the Burlington area, on campus and in the community. Uh, lots of guest speakers. And then the term projects, where the students are engaged in collecting sustainability stories. They're, in effect, what you might, if folklorists would call credible biographers. They're trying to tell these stories. So prior to working on these, they gained a strong background in sustainability through readings, lots of readings, and I, I have a, a much more extensive uh, uh, list of, of some of the articles, books, and so forth. If you, lectures, seminar discussions, and again, guest speakers and so forth. Learned a lot about some of the tools for sustainability, community visioning, indicators, and again, the gun folks, some of you people right here are leaders in a lot of these in, uh, alternatives to gross national product, gross domestic product, like GPI and so forth life cycle analysis, full cost accounting, unlearning consumerism, and just as uh, Stephanie Kaza in, in, in environmental studies in, in Rubenstein School has taught a course uh, by that title, just if we unlearn racism, uh, you know, I think unlearn consumerism. A lot of times we're ju it's just so much a part of our lifestyle that, we're, that we, don't, we don't challenge it. We're just, we're just bombarded with so many advertisements uh, through electronic media, through print media, and all that we sometimes you know, have to deconstruct it. I hate that term, but, but that's what, <laughs> to, think, to look at it that way. Similarly, just uh, I, I, there's many other tools that you ecological economists use that I should put on there too that I, I haven't updated this as, as well as I should, uh, some other approaches. Another one too is just media literacy. Again, why is it that the media is not, the mainstream media is not considering sustainability very much? Or if they do, it's kind of like on the feature page rather than on the, on the headlines page. You know, it's kind of like the eccentric old lady who gathered aluminum foil into a big ball. You know, they love that. It's kind of a feature story of some uh, quirky individual, or, you know, or the guy who collects, you know, recycling in Bristol with a, with a horse and, and cart. Uh, you know, a kind of personal interest story, but, you know, why not s substantive stories? Uh, we'll talk about that again in a minute. 
So the students also are asked to develop a sustainability scorecard. So taking all this reading about what is sustainability and what are some indicators, what are some measures of it and so forth, and developing these criteria for analyzing assessment. <laughs> so when we bring in guest speakers to talk about some of the, the NGOs they're working with or government agencies or whatever, that the students, you know, carry out this little um, scorecard. Similar when we go on field trips, when we go to the Peace and Justice Center, or go to Intervale Center, or go to Vermont Family Forest, or go to Resource, we speak recycling with them. How, do, how does it rate on these in the scorecard? So the main term project, it's about 40 to 50 percent of the grade, they are to tell, feature an individual or group in the area who can serve as a role model, exam, example that others can follow or emulate to make this transition to a more sustainable lifestyle. So, uh, and again, part of it, they inspire, they encourage, they empower others. Uh, I give them some specific criteria to think about as they're trying to decide, you know, who, who might be appropriate. Because uh, sometimes people, uh, you know, about two-thirds of the students in the class are from out of state. Um, and so, well, I know, of, you know, they might know of somebody in their state, or they might know uh, through readings, well, yeah, I, they, they pick a topic. I really liked reading about Plenty Fisk in, in Austin, Texas, and his, now he dealt with, you know, uh, alternative building materials that were right local, right from the land. Uh, and so this, they might come in with that and say, okay, well, here's somebody you might want to consider in this community who kind of an analog that. So they're reading extensively in, in some of those readings that were on there. Um, uh, one by Steve Lerner on, on eco-pioneers and other readings. So sometimes they're reading about people, um, Sally Fox, who developed cotton that's naturally colored blue and purple and so forth, instead of having to use some of those wicked chemical dyes. Uh, you know, who do we have in this community who is an analog of Sally Fox and so forth? So, that. so this whole activity, this term project, is based on the premise that once something's been done, it seems obvious it could have been done, but before it's even been attempted, let alone attempted for a long time and with some degree of success, it may be perceived to be impossible if it's even conceived of at all. And from, from Porteous, um, this, this quote, the world will not be changed for the better in any fundamental way by coercion, legislation, or even top-down education. Rather, the texture of the future depends first on the myriad of small, positive life decisions made by millions of human individuals, and second, on the spiritual enterprise of small bands of visionaries who demonstrate alternative pathways by example. Uh, again, this is fitting into a model of change that deals with looking at, at, at exemplars or models and, and telling their stories. So, I, again, I had brought, put together a lot of stories that I presented to the students and the guest speakers, and then the stories that they then began to collect as part of their term projects. They're drawn from various sectors, individuals, NGOs, higher ed organizations like UVM, like Middlebury College, like Green Mountain College, and so forth. businesses. And of course, we're lucky in Vermont to have VIBSIT, Vermont Business for Social Responsibility, and has the dozens of members that they have. Right here. And everybody knows about Ben and Jerry's and Seventh Generation, so, but there are lots and lots and lots of, of uh, triple bottom line businesses um, that, that have received national and even international attention. Government agencies. Um, at the government, at the local level, legacy project is kind of like a sustainable Burlington project. The, at the state level, things like the uh, uh, Vermont Sustainable, Sustainable Jobs Fund and others. Um, so ex some of the examples, um, individuals and families who are living low impact lifestyles, in, in cases raising all their own food, or living off the grid, um, and so forth. Um, I guess it should be now called Eco Machine, uh, John's Eco Machines. Uh, large scale composting, which you know, we had an example of right here in the Intervale, which is, and as I speak, being relocated to um, Redmond Road in Williston, Chittenden Solid Waste District. Land trust, sustainable agriculture, agroecology, permaculture, kind of thing. Um, CSAs, again, uh, lots and lots of CSAs in this community. Uh, local currency, you all know about Burlington Bread, um, and it's several iterations, and hopefully it will rise yet again. Um, 
the ecological industrial park, that's, it's actually um, proposed by Intervale Center down in the Intervale is what's called a, uh, well, it's, it's, it's an eco-industrial park that's, the hope is to take some of the waste heat from the McNeil generating station, the 50 megawatt wood chip plant that uses um, waste wood chips, um, to take capture that and use it for hard space for, for greenhouses and hard space that to raise um, raise crops year round, but to also have value added products. So taking a lot of the million pounds, million pounds of organic produce grown in Intervale every year, plus fifty thousand pounds of organic produce that goes that's gleaned for food shelves, soup kitchens and so forth. But taking some of that and maybe even expanding uh, beyond that million pounds uh, and turning it into value added uh, product. As you know, Americans generally take, um, I understand, one out of every three meals is out, is away from home, that they're eating out. Uh, and so to, to have, to build on that by having value-added products, be it salsa or, you know, wines, jellies, jams, prepared meals, like if you've been to Sugar Snap, you know, those kind of, those types of value-added products, and there'll be lots more in this um, ecological industrial park. It's called the Food Enterprise Center. That's the intended name to this, uh, the Intervale Center is proposing. And, and you could tell us a lot more about, right? Yeah, a little uh, bit. Okay. Uh, again, solar homes, solar communities, uh, and just what's, just what's blossomed just in this last year. If you've seen the solar orchard out at Shelburne Farms, if you've been down in Virgins uh, along Route 7 and seen uh, Ernie Pomerlo's you know, huge array of of, of solar panel, what, what the Rubenstein's doing right down the street here at, at the Aiken Research Lab uh, with those, or been to NRG's offices there in, in Heinsberg. Um, electric vehicles, all types of alternative vehicles, alternatives to um, you know, fossil fuel vehicles. Uh, it works up, Burlington Electric Department's received a lot of attention. Vermont Energy Investment Corporation uh, and, and its programs sustainable design, local watershed organizations, lots and lots of groups. So we have literally hundreds of pages of these and dozens of examples. Some of these dealing with natural capital, some with built, some with social capital, some with human capital. And, and following the, 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 the gun <laughs> list sort of debate here, yet I realize that there are other capitals as well. As, as, as <laughs> as <laughs> but, but this, my chance, just to plug, um, social capital. Uh, some of you probably were here when Robert Putnam, a uh, social scientist from Harvard, came and spoke at the Davis Center a couple years ago. And, he, and again, in bowling alone, uh, he talks about the decline of social capital in America. That uh, People, um, there's been a decline in number of members of fraternal and sororal organizations like Rotary and Elks and Leaf Club and those kind of things, a de decline in running for PTA. And PTA is often the training ground for then getting involved in parent-teacher associates. For then, it's a training ground for getting involved in politics, for then running for the Conservation Commission or the, or the Design Review Board or the Planning Commission or some other thing. And so, and so there's been that decline. Uh, he cites uh, decline in front porches and even some communities that outlaw front porches, uh, just as they outlaw... Um, trying your clothes. Yeah, <laughs> trying your clothes, Vermont, not Vermont, but uh, 49 other states, uh, in 49 other states, they out, some of them, they outlaw uh, individual uh, organization, homeowner associations, or condominium associations, whatever, outlaw, you know, hanging out your undies on the, on the, on the line, and so forth. But, so, so social capital, so in, in the term bowling alone, if you're not familiar, you know, people are bowling more now, more than ever, but they're not doing it as part of these clubs. And it's, when, you're, when you're bowling as part of a club, uh, then when you're not actually rolling the ball, then you're, you know, drinking soda or beer or whatever, and you're chatting with other members of your team or the team that you're playing, and you're, how are things going in school, or, or what do you think about that, that new appointment that, um, that Shumlin made her? Are you going to go to the rally in Montpelier uh, tomorrow for, for a single payer health care? Those type of things that, that, that decline. Uh, another thing he cited was the rise in backyard decks and, you know, and huge home entertainment centers. Again, this is part of 
not coming together, not going out and socializing, except maybe your own closest little group of friends, um, but like that. So social decline. So, but many of the examples that we gave, and most, much of the work of, that I've been focusing on, is the social capital aspects of sustainability. So again, we talked about the media. The mainstream media uh, doesn't touch a lot of these, or if they do, it, as I said before, they, it's, it's kind of like the quirky, kind of bizarre person uh, that they feature, as opposed to treating this. And there are a variety of reasons, as you might imagine, you know, uh, just this consolidation of the media in fewer and fewer hands, uh, just the, the lack of news reporting and entertainment, 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 and advertising, advertising, advertising. It doesn't pay. And in fact, sustainability stories might, you know, and do uh, sometimes piss off some of the advertisers. So there's been there's not a lot of in, 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 the, in the literature. Some you know people are doing content analysis of sustainability stories, and not a lot in mainstream media. Um, so again, at one time we did, um, students did videotape programs that were shown over the cable access channel during Earth Week. And, uh, now some of the students can write their papers and, and put them up on YouTube. I don't require them to do that. But, and and this, uh, they putting together this book called Sustainability Stories, a field guide to sustainability in the greater Burlington area. And many of those include um, things that the students have worked on individually or in groups. This is a transportable model. I've presented about this at different conferences in different countries and so forth in higher education settings um, and then in K-12 school settings uh, and elsewhere. So it does, it's not just limited to places like Vermont, one of the most rural states in the country. Uh, it's also uh, very, can be very appropriate in urban settings. Um, and in, in other cultures. So the National Academy of Sciences had the Board on Sustainable Development back in the 90s, that, and they talked about nav to navigate the sustainability transition successfully, the world must provide energy, materials, and information to feed, house, nurture, educate, and employ many more people than are alive today. We're, we're now thinking it's going to be that the world population is going to level out at somewhere a little over 9 billion by about 2050. Uh, while preserving the base life support systems of the planet and reducing hunger and poverty. Such a profound and unprecedented transition has no charted course. And so again, telling stories of people who are working toward that, you know, who are, and, and hopefully in successful models. You say, managing this transition that mimics natural systems, in which we accept limits, that we live gently in responsibility, treat our planet with dignity and reverence, will involve discussion, dialogue, and debate. All the stakeholders, it can't just be the experts, it can't just be the architects and engineers and, and, and political leaders, it has to be all of us. And we don't, nobody has all the right answers, and so this whole notion of, again, what Gunn does so effectively with the ateliers in terms of multi transdisciplinary problem-solving teams, drawing from different academic disciplines, from different um, professional backgrounds, and so forth. And we need new approaches, and so this idea of telling stories, providing that provide concrete examples that show it can be done. A lot of times people, oh well, you know, that's that's pie in the sky. That's uh, show, hey, it it can be done and is being done, and a lot of times it's being done right in your own community. It can hopefully provide hope rather than despair. Um, and just the notion of solutions, I know it's a great title for the year. Um, having, having a student on my course evaluations for my class that I've been doing now in this almost 20 years, 19 years now, a lot of times the students in that part where you can make individual kind of say, you know, I've gotten knocked over the head with some of my other classes uh, in environmental studies or elsewhere on campus, the doom and gloom kind of thing, and kind of this operating out of fear uh, rather than out of hope. And I like the solutions orientation of, of being able to, to, again, be a credible biographer for somebody who offers a positive solution that can address some of these um, things that are going on in our society. So, as it may, that's what it is. And as part of that, 
trying again to do what kind of things we're doing here, make sustainability come alive, and just set up networks for sharing. They've created these RCE, Regional Centers of Expertise in Education for Sustainable Development. And we've been approached and asked to submit um, submit an application. So I'm on sabbatical this semester, and I did some work in Cuba, uh, just uh, got back from a short while ago. But I've also, one of the things I'm working on a lot is helping to put together this nomination. A lot of us that are involved with sustainability and sustainability education in Burlington are so busy doing it that we don't have time just to put together this. And so hopefully we'll just, uh, well, well, not hopefully, we will, as part of this time that I'm on sabbatical, finish getting this application in. Uh, and submitting it, it goes, it goes to the Institute for Advanced Studies of UN University. It's in Yokohama, Japan, and it's well. I was invited as a guest to go to an RCE gathering that was the fourth gathering that was up in Montreal in May of 2009, and it was just again. There's this kind of arrogance of us in the global north. Thing. You know, all the work in sustainability. A lot of times, people look at technological solutions and look at you know, the work of the, of the U.S. and the U.K. and in Japan and Germany and so forth. But many of the RCEs are from Southeast Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, from, from South America, and many of them are a lot more sustainable than we are. Uh, and so much more in terms of technology transfer to fusion of innovation. I think we have as much or more to learn from them as they from us. And so that's exciting. So part of the reason, there's no money that comes if we, if the Burlington, UVM, Northern Vermont, whatever boundaries we have, gets area gets established as an RCE, it doesn't open up any coffers of money to us or anything. In fact, it costs money. The, the conference after Montreal was in Curitiba, Brazil, which costs $1,700 to get to and from, you know, that kind of thing. But it just, in the meantime, I've been able to participate by listservs with people from other list, uh, things, including one of the RCEs was Sendai Japan. And uh, one of the people that I met in Montreal is alive and well, and he's down in Tokyo area. Uh, and, you know, but just talking about just the personal story of just the incredible horror, devastation that's gone on there. So that's exciting to have this connection with others around the world uh, to share what's going on. Um, so I'll, I will put on the gun list of some as we progress on this uh, nomination for the um, RCE for this area, a draft, and, and I'll have a open sessions a couple of times on campus um, and get input from people and see what you think, any suggestions that you have. Well, thank you very much, and I know some of you have to leave. I'll, I'll be around if you want to talk further, and appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you.